place we're not allowed to reveal in Hollywood. It's the, 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 the Tom Micah Show. Wow, you're bad. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Micah. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Micah Show. This is where America gets together to talk about the issues you really care about. It's a different kind of a radio talk program. We're the radio talk show. It's not hosted by a right-wing wacko or a convicted felon. No, I am your host. I get our telephone number. You're going to need it. It's 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of our program. We are together again on the radio with wide open telephones at 1-800-5800-TOM. It's 1-800-5800-866. Philip on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Hi. How are you doing, Tom? Doing okay. Uh I have a couple of things going on. Two of them, one of them is girlfriend problem. I won't get into it. It doesn't matter. I have, basically, I'm in a band, a punk rock band. We tour. We've been all over the U.S., done shows all over, and it's being torn apart by drugs. What kind my, of drugs? Uh, well, my drummer is doing ice and coke, and the bass player doesn't, the only thing he'll do is at, after shows and parties, he'll do X. And the drummer's the really bad one about it. And I try to talk to him, hey, you know, we can't do this. We have to be focused. This is a business. To them, it's a party. It's a game. And to me, it's not. Well, and what kind of music do you guys play? It's like punk rock. It's just mainly catchy rock, something that kids can dance to and have a good time. And I I have a lot of opinions about what you're telling me. I mean, uh, on the one hand... The laws in Texas regarding drugs, uh, Mm -hmm. they they leave no doubt as to what's going to happen to you if you get caught. Right. Um, I mean, you are going to get more than spanked. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's that's number one. But number two, on the same uh, uh, by the same token, uh, some of the great rock bands in history did drugs. (laughs) Yeah. You know, right. I mean, from from Texas, Jim Morrison, uh, for example, with the Doors. um, uh, Pantera, you know, yeah. Huh? Pantera, yeah. I mean, lots of bands have done drugs. Lots of successful bands have done drugs. So I don't know what to tell you. Now, I understand because I'm a business guy, mm-hmm. and I've smoked weed over the years and stuff, but i got to tell you, um, I, I'm probably more with you in that if I thought I had a chance of becoming really, really big, really financially yeah. successful, yeah. I'd probably want to stay off that stuff. But let me ask you the question. Uh, um, how are the, all right, these guys are doing drugs. Is it affecting your work so that you can't work? It's more, more of a, a loss of interest. Like me, I'm, I'm gung ho. I'm, a, I'm probably most driven. I do, every, I write the songs, book the show. I do everything. We don't have a manager. And they're more, you know, after the show, hey, you know, let's work on this thing. We can go record this. Oh, and I'm out of money. Well, what happened to it? Dude, we blew it. We got, we, I don't care. And they won't, they won't practice. We have no money because it's blown on the stuff. And it's like, this is not how to run. The band is fun. But again, it is a business. It is. Who my, writes the songs? I mean, are these covers? Are these your own no, material? No, it, it's all, I write everything. Write the, all the music, the lyrics. It's all original. All right, so it's all yours. So you could uh, go and get a couple of other bandmates and just uh, start again. Yeah. Uh, and that might be your best shot. Yeah, that's that's kind of the thought that's crossed my mind and probably just needed someone else to tell me. Yeah. And the other thing, I. I'm 21. I lived, I've been living off and on at home. Finally left for good. I um, actually moved in with the drummer. He, uh, His sister is an underage girl and has accused me of some not so great things, if you know what I mean, with her. And to me, I'm paranoid. This is a short eyes crime, and even I know... You know, you won't get proven or anything, but the accusation, I know just how dangerous this can be. And I really don't know how to go about and deal well, with Well, that's what I'm telling you. I mean, since you write the songs, yes, sir. 
um, you hold the key here. If, if there's a following for your music <laughs> and you're writing the music, then why waste time with these losers? Take your material, make sure it's all protected by copyright and properly publish it, all that, and then bail. and Get get guys who are into being successful like you. Right. Yeah, that's... <laughs> You hate to hear the the thing you should do, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suppose that's what I should be doing. I, that's what I would do if I were you. Yeah. That's what I would be doing. I would be going out and finding other bandmates, and mm-hmm. I would see I, I would see just exactly how far I could get with other guys uh, uh, working with my same material. Hang on a second here. Philip, I'm yep. sorry, Jason, what did you want to say to Philip? That's Philip. Hey, man, what's going on, Tom? Hey, Philip, um... I was in bands, metal bands, for like 12 years, bro. And the bottom line, and I've seen, I've been through what you're going through, and I've been through what is possible to be something really big. And the difference between the two is that the bandmates weren't addicted to, Tom's right, you got to treat it like it's a business. And if you want to make money and you want to be successful at it, it's the hardest business to try and get into. And if, and if he's not, and if your guys aren't into that, well, then they're not even worth it. And by yeah. the way, with the decline and fall of record companies, if you've been following the record business, right? I mean, oh, you, yeah. need, oh, yeah. you need to have some business savvy because a lot of bands, as you see, uh, Radiohead released a CD on, online and said pay as much for it as it's worth. <laughs> well, uh, I, got... I know. And, and you know what? I, I'm like My last band, we were five years before I decided that I needed to go on to other things, you know, and, and we were doing things right. We were working it at every day. It was a, it was like a second job, Tom. I'm serious. And and dude, the bottom, the biggest thing for me was have fun. But but everybody has to know how to keep it on the straight and narrow. Don't don't start getting DUIs and screwing up and right. and, and and doing all this other stuff. I, I mean, have your fun. But wait until you're on a tour bus and somebody else is driving, you know, and, and it's already set and you've already got some money in the well, bank. Well, beyond all that, I mean, look, if you need to do gigs and you need to move forward and you're with guys who are not motivated because they're doing drugs, look, I'm, I'm no prude. I'm no prude about sex or drugs or rock and roll. I'm, I'm, I'm all about either. that. But I'm a also a businessman, and I, I know that if you write the songs, you essentially own the business. The just, exactly. just ask the guys who write. Look, here's a band that's been around a long time that has nothing to do with punk rock. Look at the battles the Eagles have had over the years. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. the guys who write the songs appear to make more money than the guys who don't. Yeah. Well, anyway, the guy who writes the songs to... has the key to everything. If you've got good music, if you write good songs, you own yeah. the property. A lot well, I just, I just basically wanted to say, I want to get off the phone with you, Tom, but because uh, I'm driving down 405, man. Uh, but basically, Philip, keep these things in mind. Service marks the name of your band. First well, sorry, and foremost, own, own the name. And then oh, yeah. copyright. It's, uh, all the copyrights are done in my name. It's all everything. Okay, well, then, in that respect, you're looking, bu- looking good. But, dude, get your dudes off of the drugs, man, and tell them that it's their, it's just as much their job. I don't think you can yours. get people off drugs. I think you have There's to say, you know what? True. They have yeah. to want it themselves. If they don't right. want it, get the hell out of here. That's exactly well, that's, that's what you're going to do. Is that like these are people I've lived with these people, and I work with these people every day, and so it's family. Yeah, but the, these are dysfunctional yeah. family members, yeah. I, it's, and it's dysfunctional empathy, family just... members need tough love. There's an old book out there from the '80s called Tough Love. Yeah. Maybe you need to read it. Uh, it's you know you you want to help them so bad, and it's like if you could get off this, we would it'd be great. We've you can't help anybody. Like you can't. Uh, believe me, I had heroin addicts, heroin addicts in my uh, extended family. My, I have three first cousins who were all heroin addicts. They were all brothers. Mm-hmm. And you can't help people like that. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. You're right. I mean, that's why there are therapists and drug counselors and rehab centers uh, any more than I would try to fix my own plumbing. Yeah. Instead of calling a plumber, yeah. you're not going to get anybody off of, from being a drug addict. Yeah. All right, Tom. I appreciate it, man. I'm here to help. Good luck. Jeez. 1-800-5800-TOM. All right, Philip left us here, but uh, Angela, you were going to say something to him. What did you want to say? 
Yeah, first of all, uh, you know, I have to say I agree with Philip that was on before. And I have to, uh, one thing about the music industry, first of all, is today it is a business. There is no screwing around, none whatsoever. I tour with rock bands, I make music documentaries, and I'll tell you something. There's a time to party and there's a time to do business. And exactly what Phil said, on the bus, when someone else is driving, that's when you do your partying. And if these guys are partying now, forget it. They're not going to break anyway. And take the risk and walk away. This business is about taking risks. Take the risks, grab your you-know-what, and get out of there. Yep, I, I agree with you. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be, a, you know, a hard ass. I'm just saying this is what it's all about. You're smart. You're talented. You're booking the shows. You're writing the music. Take it and go. You have the talent. Do it. Get out now. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, I. by the way, I've got friends who do hard drugs, and they're friends, and they'll always be friends, but I wouldn't do business with them. You know, and, and yes, you know, the thing is, yes, rock and roll, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's very elusive. It's very sexy, and every young guy and young girl that wants to be a rock star or any kind of musician, that's the lure. And it's understandable that people go, wow, they can do it, I can do it too. But what they don't talk about is that people are dying, people are ODing, people are losing their minds, losing their lives, losing their families, crashing cars, paralyzed. You know, it happens every day, and that's not talked about, you know? I mean, I hate to get all, you know, psychological about it, but it's a business. Business comes that's first. That's what it is, and it's more business now than ever. You have to be more creative than just writing songs and recording them. You might have to figure out how to market your stuff. Absolutely. You might have to, whether it's a MySpace or a Facebook page, whether it's uh, figuring out a way to distribute on the Internet. I mean, the idea of forming a band and then waiting for, you know, Sony or Warner or Universal to come discover you, those days are rapidly coming to an end. Absolutely. I agree 100%. It's called fan base. It's called fan base, and it's absolutely about MySpace. Every, I mean, I hate to bring up Creed, but Creed, they have started their own label. They got hot. They had their fans. That's how they made their money. And, and you know, talking about a Radiohead, it, exactly. But, you know, I, I suggest that this guy don't, don't really go on the Internet and ask how much your fans want to pay for it. Because if you don't have your fan base and these guys are screwing up, they don't care. And, you know, and I understand that sometimes it's like you party and, and, you know, that's where I get my creative juice. They, it doesn't have to be that way. You know what I'm I saying? I agree with you. And, and, and I, by the way, I also believe that if you're going to be in business, you've got to be with people who are in business, with a head for business and the attention span to be in business and real desire and ambition. And uh, not to be one of these people who you just says, oh, you know, I don't still don't feel like going out. I don't feel like playing a gig this Friday. I just yeah. don't feel like, oh, God, it would make me sick if I were a guy like that. Tom Likas. 1-800-5800-866. Tom Likas. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's a good slogan for our show. Better than a fatal accident. The Tom Likas Show. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm calling about, uh, uh, well, I need to know how you uh, succeeded in uh, stand-up comedy or how you ended up getting paid money doing that. Well, uh, the way I got paid in stand-up comedy is different from the route most people took. Right. Because I became known for doing funny things on the radio. Okay. And then I told people that I was going to make an appearance in public. It's a lot easier than yeah. starting from scratch at small comedy clubs and working your way up and trying to get name recognition. The hardest thing right. for comedians is getting name recognition. Yeah, I've and been a and fan even day. even the biggest name comedians are frequently unknown to most of the public. Yes, I know that. 
So uh, it's a matter of uh, becoming known. I mean, Dane Cook is well known for having used his MySpace page to build a career out of it. <laughs> Dane Cook. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, oh, laugh at Dane. I like him. He's, a good he's been on our show. Laugh at Dane Cook, if you will. But the guy took a MySpace page and turned it into a career. Right. Oh, I don't hate Dane Cook at all. I, I, I like anyone who is doing something with their lives, someone, you know, yeah. doing what they love. Well, Dane Cook, by, by the way, Dane Cook went from MySpace page to stand-up comedy to play in big venue stand-up comedy to playing a romantic lead in a movie with Jessica Alba. I mean, the guy right. has had an incredible career. He's doing great. I'm I'm so proud of him. Plus, he's hosted Saturday Night Live and came back for do a few cameos there. I right. mean, I, I give the guy a lot of credit, and, and by the way, I like yeah. him as a person. He's a nice guy, and uh, I got another bad to say about Dane Cook. You, you could learn from that guy. Right. Oh, I watch him. Anytime he's on, I'll watch him to learn. I mean, I might not laugh at his jokes so much, but I'm just looking to see what he's doing, you know, like how he's presenting himself and things like that uh, when I watch any good comic. And uh, basically, uh, I don't know, my, I would have an audience that, uh, I don't know, generally my audience is uh, uh, lack understanding, I guess, of me. I grew up uh, in Japan. I'm, a, I'm white, but I grew up in Japan, so I talk a lot about that. Right. And I, I get a lot of, uh, like, blank stares. I get laughs, too, you know, but uh, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm kind of a pussy when it comes to, you know, the business side of, uh, comedy, you know, getting myself up at these uh, major venues, these paid venues. Well, Tyler, you better lose that soon right. because you're not an artist, okay? You are a vendor. You're selling a product. The product just happens to have your name. Right. And you have to sell yourself like you're selling a, a box of Jello. I mean, you, you have to market yourself. Almost to sell out. It's not selling out. Every comedian on stage is hoping to be discovered by The Tonight Show or right. by Letterman or by Comedy Central or get discovered to do a sitcom based on uh, his routine. Right. Everybody. I mean, how many pure comics are out there who don't care if they ever make a living? None. Everybody. Yeah. And yeah. That's like when people talk about bands. Oh, this band sold out. What band isn't looking for a record contract? That's right. I mean, well, I guess selling out are those I say those types that will do anything, even if it's a crappy uh, show or you know what I mean, like go on a uh, on something that you don't really support or like just because you're getting money. Hey, don't knock them because right. they've got something you don't have: visibility and money. Right. Uh, I mean, so you're, I, you're, you know, I learned yeah, a long you, time ago. I learned a long time ago. Not to make fun of people who are successful, even if they're successful doing something that I personally don't like. Right. Yeah. I mean, because it's all about business. And I look beyond the content of people's creative material to the business model. Mm. Can they make money doing this? You're not going to hire someone if you, you see that they're not a good fan. Look, if you're a comedian, you can't pack the house with 300 people or whatever. You're not going to get hired for gigs, right. and no That's one will ever hear your work. Yeah, when I first started, people would come out. My friends, oh, you're doing comedy now? Okay, I'll check it out. And then they'll see my show once, maybe twice. And then I, it looks like you got to make more friends after that, you know, because those friends are done. Or you got to write a lot more material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New jokes. Well, how many fresh. times are people going to go see the same jokes? Exactly. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, seriously, you know, if you've got 20 minutes of good material and your friends have seen it two or three times, you know, their patience is wearing thin. I mean, they're, they're going right. to go look for new entertainment. Well, I'd punch me in the face if, <laughs> if I had to pay pay money to see the same thing. Well, do you know how many comedians, come on, you go to comedy clubs, how many comedians are doing the same material they were doing two years ago? Uh, Almost all of them, at least a couple jokes, you know. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, me too, actually. Mm -hmm. I tend to do, if I go up at a big show, you know, where I have people coming, uh, when I have people that I know come to see me, I, I really want to do well. I'm going with the stuff that I know that works instead of uh, putting my neck out there and taking a risk.
Well, you should. This is the time to be taking that risk. This is the time to be doing the outrageous stuff or the stuff that people haven't tried before. This is the time. Right. I mean, imagine you're locked into being George. And again, I think he's a good comedian and he's been on our show and uh, uh, we consider him a friend, George Lopez. George now, Lopez. I mean, now he's the George Lopez persona. Yep. He as as good as his stuff is. He has to be that. If he goes on stage and does something else, like he tries uh, to be George Carlin or he tries right. to be, uh, you know, somebody else, the audience will reject it now. Yeah, because he's got this that. This is what you and... have now. By the way, this uh, is when you should be doing that. Right, and see and find what your stick is, whatever you right. want to call it, your voice. Yeah. And, mm. and yes, push the boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. When I do push boundaries, people end up getting really mad. But I'm sure you're familiar with that. And that's I am. Like why I, you the are point is, don't do it the way Michael Richard. Don't do it the way Michael Richards did it. Did it? Okay. Oh, no, that was no, just, no, no. That was stupid. That was dumb. Okay. I mean, but there's other ways to push boundaries. Keep right. in mind, as I've always said about my radio program, um, every time there's a big FCC controversy, I always go to the management and they say they still haven't taken away misogyny and blasphemy. <laughs> yep, you see what yep. I'm saying? And that's how I stay in business. You know, after Janet, just to give you an example in my own business, after Janet Jackson bared her breast on TV and the FCC cracked down on everybody, uh -huh. Lots of guys lost their jobs. Lots of guys had no material. Lots of guys said, what am I going to do now? Right. There's one person who kept at it and continued to refine the work until we're number one again. Uh -huh. but, and we don't that? break the law and we don't get fined by the FCC because we don't do that stuff. Yeah, I don't understand FCC and their priorities at all. But you, but you hear what I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, if, if there's particular things you know that are going to hurt your business, you don't do those things. Right. But mm -hmm. there are ways to be outrageous. You might, by the way, you're always going to offend some people. I offend people every day. Right. But you have to figure out who your core constituency is. Your audience. And then, we, as we say in the marketing field, super serve your core constituency. Figure uh -huh. out who your prime audience is and then do the outrageous stuff that they want from you. Right. And then if people who are not in your target audience, 50-year-old females or whoever you decide your audience isn't, if they get offended and they walk out, so what? It burnishes your reputation. Same with me. Guys yeah. come and say, my wife hates your show. I say, that's how I know I'm doing it right. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, that's true. I got a little, uh, what do you call it, a, one of those comments on YouTube of one of my videos. This guy was really mad at me, and I thought, okay, this, kinda, this dumb ass is mad at me, so... I guess I'm doing something right. Am I allowed to say dumbass? Um... Yes, you can say dumbass. Okay. So... Yes. <laughs> yeah. What about a hole? You can say a hole. Can't say. You can't say the, say the whole word. thing. They would bleep out the whole part, right? They bleep out the whole thing. Oh, okay. I mean, let me explain how this works, okay? You can say ass, and you can say whole yes <laughs> just don't put together. them together yeah i mean it's that simple yeah on tv say they actually bleep out the whole part well you know again we're not on tv this is the radio and uh, different companies do it differently but mm -hmm. uh you know i mean for example if there's just some words it depends on the context right like, if you're a rooster on a radio show, you can say cock a doodle do. You can say that. Yeah. Okay. But if you're not a rooster and you're not saying cock a doodle do, you might get in trouble. Right. If you subtract the doodle do, you're in trouble. Well, uh, for example, now, if I get even with somebody, I could say it was tit for tat. I could say that. Uh huh. Uh huh. But, you know, if I said something else, I might get in trouble. Right. Uh, you see how it works? And, uh, yeah, and and I guess it would be uh, similar with, you know, audiences, you know, as with the FCC. Well, you, you see, with audiences, uh, you don't have to worry about regulation. The, the market will regulate you. 
Yeah. I mean, you don't want to be so outrageous that, that four fifths of your audience walks out. That's what Michael Richards found out. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's not how outrageous you you want to be outrageous in a way that your core audience loves what you're doing, and people who weren't that hot on you anyway are now really offended. No, so it's a, yeah. I mean, like, what I do on this time. show is I do the stuff. My guys are guys eighteen to thirty, eighteen to forty, eighteen to forty-four, whatever. That's my audience, yep. and so I do stuff that would be offensive to people who, who are outside of that uh, that target demographic. Guys, eighteen to forty-four. Women hate me. Girls hate me. Uh, your grandmother hates me. Guys over forty-five are offended. They, they well, yep. I never, you know. But but I don't care if they're offended. The, the, as long as I'm not offending my constituency, I will be as outrageous as right. they will let me be. Yeah, if you're offending people outside that, that means, like you said, you're doing your job right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And to give you an example, okay, um, if I can, I have a 40% Hispanic audience, okay? If there was an earthquake in Mexico, and Mexico has had earthquakes just like California, and I said, well, what the hell, who cares? Like, yeah. Just something stupid like that. It's not um, funny anyway. But if I said something like that, that would offend my target audience. Even if I thought something really ridiculous and stupid like that was funny, why would I want to offend my audience? I right. want to offend the people who are not in my audience, the people who are not my constituency. Right. You see? Uh-huh. So I got to figure out who the, my, who is my audience. I had a guy come up to me after a show once and say, you know what? Maybe you should consider doing your comedy in, you know, little Tokyo to Japanese people. And that's a, such a small audience, and so I realized i got to broaden my... Well, not only uh, that, I mean, it's it's kind of racist if you think about it. I mean, you're an American, number one. Yeah. I mean, why should you have to do your act in Little Tokyo? Right. Maybe you don't want all of your material to be about being part Japanese. Yeah, oh, these days, actually, you know, i got maybe ten minutes on that, and then the rest of it... The rest of it is just regular stuff. Perfect. So I'm okay. But there. to tell you you should be playing in Little Tokyo, to me that's a racist comment. And he was black. Well. <laughs> was he doing his act in uh, Compton? No. In, uh, oh. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. All right, Tyler, it's been great talking to you. Best of luck with your career. I really mean it. Tom, 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 Tom Likas, 1-800. 5-800-TOM. Getting married or having a girlfriend doesn't make you any less alone than you already are. If you got someone in your bed, you got someone to, you know, be with. But you realize you could have someone different in your bed every night of the week. Every night could be a new adventure. The Tom Likas Show. Fire! It's the Tom Likas Show. From our nation's capital, Hollywood, California. At 1 800 5 800 Tom, that's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to State. How'd you get a name like State? Hey, Tom, how you doing? You I'm okay. Is that because hey, you've spent a lot of time at State? Actually, my full name is State Knee. I'm named after my dad, and then, you know, I just shortened it to make it easier. How'd he get a name like that? He got it from his dad. And any further than that, I couldn't tell you. Maybe maybe uh, they spent time in the state penitentiary. Uh, I, I, you have I don't a brother know. named I, Federal. I, none of us have spent time in, in the state of federal penitentiary, but you know, well, just a weird name. I thought yeah. maybe it came from somewhere. But it's good. You see, it's good because what it is is the conversation I repeat with the ladies. <laughs> it works out. I understand. Yeah, yeah, Tom. I I, I really had to call in. I just got to say, uh, you know what? I started basically. I took this class before uh, two years ago, and I dropped out, and I shouldn't have. And I got back into your class over. Oh, you're talking about 101. You took 101. Talking about 101, Tom. Yeah. Talking about 101. And I got back into your class uh, about two months ago. Oh, By the way, your there. train is arriving back. right now. I don't know if you noticed. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm at home, and you can hear all that. What do you live? Where do you live in the train station? Where do you live? Uh, I'm pretty close to one. I'm in uh, West Covina, real close to the the big train depot over here. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Kind of sucks when you're trying to sleep, but <laughs> other than other than that, it's it's fine, you know. So, I understand. Okay. But, but yeah, I got to say, you know, I, I've been taking your class uh, from about the last six months. Before that, I was a nice guy that you always talk about, you know, the one who's always taking the girl out to dinner, and she's on the phone text messaging or calling somebody else. 
And, uh, you know, eventually I just I got tired of doing that and being the one who's getting stepped all over. And now, right now, I'm talking to, uh, I'm talking to this girl now who listens to you, too. And now I, I realize that I'm the other guy now. Now I'm the guy that you tell us to be. It's like I'm the guy who's texting her saying, hey, are you done? You know, you want right. to do something? So I got to say, Tom, I got to say thank you. And I'm, I'm definitely not jumping out of this class again. I'm definitely going to stick with this one. And, uh, and uh, personally, I was telling Dean, I, I think you should run for president. I think the way that this classroom runs is the way that this country should be run. I agree. Get all those bitches in line. That's how you do John it. John McCain be damned. That, that's how you got to do it. That's right. So, believe me, you'd win the California vote and wherever else you're on the air. That's for sure. Hey, our governor grabbed the ashes of how many women? Come on. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I could run against Schwarzenegger and I could give him a run for his money. Oh, definitely. Because I, I would not deny grabbing women's asses. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll run on the ass grabber party. I was going to say, you'd base your entire campaign on that, wouldn't you? I, are you kidding me? I've grabbed more ass. I don't care how many asses he's grabbed. I've grabbed more. <laughs> that's the way to do it. See, now that, that's why I'm back in this class, because I'm trying to grab as many as you have, you know? That's right. It's, it's, that's how you got to do it. So. <clears throat> That's all I really have to say. I just wanted to say thank you. And to all the guys out there that are listening that are, may just be getting started in this class, don't drop out of this class. Take this class. This man knows what he's talking about. The professor knows. Do not challenge the professor. And for everybody who thinks they know more than the professor like I did, you don't. Trust me, you don't. You're going to get stepped on. You're going to get mad. And then what's going to happen? You're going to end up right back here in the, in the worst situation. So, Tom, I, I just got to say thank you for this class and thank you for doing this public service. And as long as you're going to be teaching, I'm going to be listening. State, thank you very much for that. 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number. Michael on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Tom, how you doing, buddy? Doing great. I just wanted you, previously you were talking about, obviously, on uh, of FCC radio broadcast, and you have to be careful with uh, the callers that call in and, and, the, and the, obviously the cuss words that might be leaked out on the air, but... Don't you believe that it's just a sound and there's just so much censorship in this, uh, censorship in this country that it's almost beyond belief that we can't say a word that sounds very familiar to, as to other words. For example, if we use the F word, we can't obviously use that word on the air. I understand that, according to the FCC. But if I were to say truck, there's not much difference between that word and the F word. I mean, don't you believe that there's just too much censorship in this country that we just don't allow that opportunity for people to just speak their mind and use the vocabulary that they want to use? Of course, but, uh, but but you see, I I have to be more pragmatic about it. I have a show to do every day. And so that may be true. In fact, I agree with what you're saying, but what can I do? Oh, I understand that. But, I mean, when you look at uh, just the images that are on TV and the censorship that, that, that occurs there, and, and um, obviously, you, again, have to be wary of what words are used on the air, I mean... Do you think that it's almost overkill in the sense that we censor it so much that, I mean, people use those, yes. those words. It's part of the common vernacular that's used every day. I mean, it, I mean, don't you think it's overkill? We censor too yes, much in this country? Yes, I do. Although, I mean, it's, it's, you know how I've made a living? I've made a living being outrageous within the context of the rules. Right, and I, and I can understand that. But I just, I just feel like there's just too much government control and there's just they they sort of put their hand in just too much yeah but there too many of your neighbors write to the government and say please control it more and it's wrong i mean it's not like we have a a, a, a monarchy in this country and the king decreed that the f word's not allowed uh, you've got an awful lot of people in this country who write into the government and say please it's the public airway if you have to control what's going on it's disgusting and, Can and you imagine those, how your show would be if you were on, like, an XM? Uh, or you know, three, I've had this conversation. Anything? Our show is as good as it can be. And I, I, I say this having heard radio shows that are now on satellite radio uh, that use uh, every word of the book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the people did good shows in terrestrial radio, but when they go to satellite radio... It's interesting and shocking the first couple of days, and then after a while, pretty much you're listening to the same show. And it doesn't make shows consistently better. And I guess the, the topics that you cover, I mean, you can obviously do it on... 
free radio, or you could do it on I mean, let me give you an example, Michael. I don't know what kind of job you have, but I'd be willing to bet that you can't use the F word on your boss. There's no federal regulation about it. But if you came in and said, let's F our competition, F them hard, let's F them, um, I'm sure the boss would call you in for a meeting. Yeah, you're probably right. I, mean, I work in okay. a more professional environment, but believe and me, I would, would you be better at your boss. job if you were free to tell your boss, "Let's f the competition." Right. No, you'd be just as good at what you do. No, I understand. Or, that. or just as I, untalented I, as what at what you do. Bad. What what satellite radio has exposed, and the people we're talking about know who they are. Is yeah. that once they got to satellite radio, we discovered that all they had was the threat of saying the F word, and now they're saying it. But they don't have any material. They don't have any talent. You know, they would always say, well, if only we could get to satellite radio, we'd, that show would be so much better because it would be, be free to do whatever we want. And then when you turn them on, F this, F that, F this, F that. But, but it isn't that funny. It wasn't that funny before, and it's not that funny now. One thing I will say about Howard Stern, Howard Stern had a great show even when he was being censored. Even when he had constrictions and rules, his show was great. So yep. going to satellite radio, in my opinion, didn't make it better. He was already great, and, and he did not need satellite radio for that. Now, if he feels he does, and they gave him half a billion reasons to give it a shot, Great. <laughs> dollars, right? I'm behind him all the way. I think it's I, I'd love to see more guys get a half a billion dollars to do that. I think it's great. But my opinion is Howard Stern could have stayed doing what he was doing uh, for the rest of his life, being bleeped here and there now and then or maybe being bleeped a lot. He would still be the number one show in his time slot. He would still have millions upon millions of dollars in advertising revenue and he would still be revered as this big cultural icon. Well, I think I think you're you are primed to be, and not necessarily his replacement, but as far as free radio is concerned, I think that you, in a sense, I mean, don't take this the wrong way. I think in a, you have a huge opportunity to be the next Howard Stern. I mean, there's nobody that I've heard on the radio that comes close to just sort of being honest, being just uh, you know, being who you are. And and I think that you have a huge opportunity to be. And again, don't take this the wrong way, but being the next Howard Stern, being number one in radio, and I, well, I, I don't, I don't take that. I take that are. as a compliment, but uh, yeah, I think, I think the, the the subjects that you that you actually talk about are relevant. They're current. They're. I mean, your listeners need to understand that we all come from different backgrounds, Tom. But what you talk about is so true, and I just want your listeners to realize that. Again, we all come from different backgrounds. We could be, you know, blue collar workers, white collar workers, but. The, the information that you're providing is actually very universal. I think that everyone needs to realize that when it comes to being smart, being educated, investing, and in some ways being selfish and taking care of number one, and that's us men. And I love the message that you're sending out there, and I just want you to continue to do that. And you've got a huge support base, and it's nationwide. I don't know what how how, how wide your 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 show is broadcast, but. I would imagine you've got a huge number of supporters out there, and uh, stay what, stay doing what you're doing because you're phenomenal at it. Thank you so much. I appreciate the call. I really do. It's one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Let's say hi here to Victor on the Tom Like His Show. Tom, Victor, how are you? Great, Tom. Uh, I know you went to South America during your uh, trip, so. I'm from South America as well, so how did you enjoy it? And, you know, what, what did you do for fun out there? What, you know, what country are you from? From Uruguay, Montevideo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was uh, in, in Uruguay. I was in uh, uh, Punta del Este. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Conrad, right, if I'm not mistaken. That's where I stayed, at the Conrad. That's right. That's right. Um, so what did you do out there? Like, did you go to the clubs? or cause I, Clubs you know? that opened at 1 a.m. Open for business at 1 a.m., which is pretty amazing, till sunrise. Um, you know, great restaurants. The most expensive filet mignon in town was $9. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's, uh, it's real cheap out there. So um, did you get a chance to go out to the estancias, to the, you know, to the fields? Right no, I, no I was, I was because I was only there for about five days. So I really just partied and took advantage of the city and everything it had to offer. It was fantastic. I tell you this, I definitely plan to go back. Nice country, clean country, and a hell of a lot of fun.
The Tom Likas Show.